to go. Okay, great. Um, so, um, hi everybody. My name is Adam Wagner, um, and you should be able to see Kirsty Brimlow QC, um, who is going to be giving this seminar along with me. Um, thanks very much for coming along. Sorry for the confusion with the email, um, with the link, but that should all be sorted now. Um, for those who are new to Zoom and haven't attended a webinar before, um, you'll notice your mics are muted and your videos are off. And that's a pre-setting, so don't be alarmed. It just stops any background interference. You'll see, I think at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A function. And we're asking that you use this ra rather than raise a hand, um, the, the sort of virtual hand. And what we'll try and do is if you just post questions as and when they arise um, during the webinar, we'll answer them either as we're going, if we, if we can spot them, but, uh, but we'll definitely leave time for questions at the end. And just to let you know, we're recording the session. Um, so if, if you, when you are um, asking a question, if you don't want your name mentioned, then please just, just put that in the, in the text and it won't come up. Um, but a copy will be available. And I'll also make sure that you um, can, everybody gets the slides, which, which we'll post online. Um, so the, the structure, so if you, you should be able to see my slides. And if anyone has a problem seeing the slides, um, just, uh, put a put a note in the in the webinar chat. Um, the, the the title of the webinar is emergency police police powers. What are they and how should they be exercised? And the way it's going to run is, we I'll start by summarising the regulations under the Public Health Control of Disease Act 1984, uh, which are otherwise known as the lockdown regulations, and those are the ones which um, stop people leaving the house without reasonable excuse. Kirsty is then going to look at the Coronavirus Act 220, um, sorry, 2020, and the, there's some police powers in there. Um, and Kirsty will also list some potential issues with both the regulations and the Coronavirus Act in terms of police powers and potential actions. And then we'll open up for questions. So I'm going to start with the um, coronavirus regulation. In fact, I want to start with this slide, which is just the front cover of the National Police Chief Council guidelines, guidance and the College of Policing guidance, which has this massive red box, which I really, I really like the massive red box because it says exceptional powers for exceptional circumstances only support public health. And, and that is, it's, it's actually repeated on every single page of the guidance. And I do wonder whether Kirsty has something to do with, with that big red box, because um, I shall tell you later, she identified an early miscarriage of justice, which occurred under the Coronavirus Act. And I think it did probably cause a bit of panic amongst the police community about how these powers are going to be exercised. But support public health, exceptional powers for exceptional circumstances only is a very good tagline for all of these powers under the Act and the regulations. So. Starting with the regulations, there are, there are four different sets of regulations um, and, and confusingly they're not all the same, but they apply to the four constituent parts of the UK. Um, and I've, I've added for when you get the PowerPoint, you, you can click on the hyperlinks and, and find those regulations. Um, they are different to each other, but for the purpose of this seminar, we're going to focus on the, on the powers in England with a, with a few mentions of the, the powers elsewhere where that where they differ but it's not going to be exhaustive so the regulations key points um they came into force on the 26th of march 2020 um so they've been in force for just over 21 days um there were, the the regulations had no debate or vote in parliament they were emergency regulations brought in under emergency powers and in fact an emergency um, provision within the Public Health Act which allows for them to be brought in without any debate or vote. Um, they, they gave legal effect to the lockdown which was announced three days earlier on the 23rd of March 2020. Um, they must be reviewed by the Secretary of State for Health every 21 days and upon that review any restriction which is no longer necessary must be terminated. However, there's no requirement to publish that review or even mention it. And in fact, the Secretary of State for Health um, apparently did review the powers on the 16th of April, but we, we didn't hear anything from him specifically about what 
he decided, except that it appears that they are carrying on. Um, the emergency period in the regulations is the is the period during which they're enforced. So, so they, um, you can only have these kind of regulations during the emergency period, and the two the two um, the two uh, time periods are the same, which is different to the Coronavirus Act, where you can switch on and off the powers. Um, the regulations only last for twenty eight days unless they're approved by resolution, resolution of both Houses of Parliament during that period. However, and, and that's how the, the Public Health Act designs it, but the period doesn't include, the period freezes, the time freezes during any adjournment of Parliament. So in fact, the relevant period is until the 18th of May. So these regulations will stay in force until the 18th of May, unless they're terminated by the Secretary of State or confirmed by resolution of both Houses of Parliament. Um, there hasn't been much mention of that, in fact, um, and I only realised it when I was going through the regs um, for, for this seminar. Um, there's, a, there's a general long stop of six months, so even if Parliament does confirm the regulations, they will end after six months. Um, so I, I've just put in to the slides this nice timeline, um, which is from the Institute of Government um, reports, which shows the, the speed at which the, this has all happened um, and divides it by different jurisdictions. Um, and I won't go through that, but that, those are the dates, some of which I was, I was just talking about. I suppose that the next relevant date is there's going to be a review um, of, the, of the regulations. I, I think it's on the 8th of May. Okay, so, so the regulations themselves, well, there, there are really three main aspects to them closure of premises, restrictions on movement, and restrictions on gatherings. So starting with closures of premises, I mean, simply put, if your business is listed in Schedule 2, Part 1 of the Act, then you have to close it. So that's things like cinemas and sports stadiums and the like. If, if you're not allowed to sell food and drink on premises, but in certain circumstances you can you can sell food and drink to be take to takeaway, so that's takeaway restaurants and coffee places, that kind of thing. Um, all businesses not listed in Schedule Two, Part Three, must close. So the, the, there is a list of businesses businesses that can stay open, um, and the kinds of places that must close are holiday accommodation, places of worship, community centres, crematoria, crematorium, crematoria. Um, and burial grounds closed except for spe specific purposes. So um, those certain places can open for, for, for example, uh, crematoria can open to hold cremations. Um, that, that's regulation four and five, regulations four and five, closure of premises. Then there's regulation six. This is the famous one, restrictions on movement. This is what stops us leaving our houses um, well, in fact, leaving the place where we are living without a reasonable excuse. And just pausing there, it, it's important to note that the language in this part of the regulations is leaving the place when we are living. So the actual lawful and unlawful behaviour arises at the point where you leave you, the place where you are living. And what it doesn't, well, I mean, this has to be tested, but very arguably, if you leave the place you're living with a reasonable excuse, and whilst you're out, you do something else, then arguably there is no jurisdiction, there is no um, criminal offence of breaching the restrictions well, uh, for, for changing your mind or for doing something extra, because of that slightly funny wording, leave the place they're living. And Regulation 6 contains a non-exhaustive list of reasonable excuses and how do we know it's non-exhaustive because it, a re, the language is a reasonable excuse includes the need so includes is non-exhaustive um, i've listed here in the, this and the next slide the reasonable excuses which are listed um, and you you may have heard of some of these because they, they to an extent reflect the government guidance obtaining basic necessities the essential upkeep, maintenance and functioning of the household, taking exercise, seeking medical assistance, 
providing care or assistance, donating blood, traveling for the purposes of work where it's not reasonably possible for the person to work or to provide those services, attend a funeral, um, fulfill a legal obligation, including attending court. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm just going to go before I leave this slide, just a few things to note. There's no, um, there's no ban on buying essential items. Um, so the police have been uh, searching people's shopping trolleys for Easter eggs. I, I have no basis for doing that because remember, well, first of all, it's where, what you leave your house to do, not what you do when you get there. But also you can obtain, you can leave the house to obtain basic necessities, including food, medical supplies, et cetera. And we'll, we'll look at those examples. The other thing to note in B is you can take exercise. There's no one day, once a day requirement. That comes from two places, that once a day requirement. It comes from the government guidance, which um, we'll go, Kirsty will talk about later. It is different in some ways to the regulations, which is confusing. But it also comes out of the Welsh regulations, which do say only once a day, um, which is super confusing. Um, fulfill a legal obligation, which includes attending courts or to participate in legal proceedings. I was asked by a legal journalist recently whether they reporting on a legal proceeding would be participating in the legal proceedings. Open question. Um, access critical public services, including child care and educational facilities social services, um, DWP services, and, provide, and, and services provided to victims, such as victims of crime. Um, relation to children to continue existing arrangements for access to and contact between parents and children. I mean, that seems to be added in between the government announcement on the 23rd of March and the regulations because it was raised as an issue um, and, and, and I think hastily um, added in. Um, and then there is, a, in the case of a minister of religious worship, to go to their place of worship, to move house uh, where reasonably necessary and to avoid illness or Ill injury and escape the risk of harm. And illness um, must include physical or mental illness um, and escape a risk of harm um, was added in, I think, to address potential um, issues of domestic violence. So that was regulation six. And then, and then on to regulation seven, restrictions on gatherings. Um, during the emergency period, no person may participate in a gathering in a public place of more than two people. Um, and there is a list of exceptions and they are exhaustive. Um, as in they're, 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 there's no additional restrictions that, such as when it's reasonably necessary. Um, that, so if you're out with people from the same household, there's no limit on the number of people from the same household. Gatherings essential for work purposes, attending a funeral, or reasonably necessary to facil facilitate a house move, provide care or assistance to a vulnerable person, provide emergency assistance, or to participate in legal proceedings, or fulfill legal obligations. So those are the reasons you can gather with more than two people. Um, so those are the three main regulations for what you can and can't do. Um, moving on to enforcement powers. So the enforcement powers are, are very extensive and wide, um, but, but if you put it that way, um, and as extensive and wide as they could possibly be really when it comes to the police. Um, they, so Regulation 8 contains the enforcement powers. A relevant person who can exercise powers under Regulation 8 is a constable. Um, a police community support officer, a person designated by a local authority, um, but only in relation to regulations four and five, so only in relation to premises. So a, um, I was in the park the other day and there was a, it, it appears that Barnet Council have um, done what quite a few councils are apparently doing, which is they've reassigned um, parking attendants to parks. So they're now park attendants um, and they are they have some, so I, don't, I, could, the, I don't know what guidance they're following, but they are doing things like stopping people sitting on benches for too long, those sorts of things. But they don't have powers and, uh, to, to stop people, leave, for example, leaving the house or gathering. They only have powers to designate, uh, sorry, they only have powers for in relation to closures and opening of premises. 
Um, I don't know if the council know councils know that or not, or whether they, you know, maybe they're just exercising general powers, um, but they certainly can't use reasonable force though, and those sorts of things that police can. Um, and then fourth, a person designated by the Secretary of State for the purposes of the regulation. And I don't know whether anybody has been designated by the Secretary of State yet, but maybe if anyone else knows, they can um, they can tell us. Um, a relevant person may take such action as is necessary to enforce any requirement imposed by regulation four, five or seven. Um, so that applies to closures of premises or public gatherings. Bit, a bit confusing here, it doesn't apply to leaving the house. Um, but that is, you'll see, very, very wide. Take such action as is necessary, um, whatever that means. Um, they can give a prohibition notice to, if, if a relevant person, um, that's one of the four previously, believes that A, a person is contravening regulation five, um, sorry, four or five, and is necessary and proportionate to avoid future contravention. So that's relation to premises, prohibition notices. Now, a relevant person who considers that a person is outside the place they are living in contravention of regulation 6.1 may A, direct the person to return to the place where they are living, or B, remove that person to the place where they are living. Now, you may notice a difference in the language of the enforcement power and section six, uh, regulation six itself, because the enforcement power um, refers to being outside the place where they are living in contra contravention of regulation six one, whereas reg regulation six one itself refers only to leaving um, the place that they are living without a reasonable excuse. Now, you would think that because it refers back to six one, the person being outside is, um, is effectively irrelevant. It, it doesn't really matter if, if they're outside or inside. The point is that they've contravened regulation 6.1. And um, so probably the, the best way to interpret it is that it's when you know, the police find somebody um, who is maybe sunbathing in the park and they say to them, why are you here? And they say, well, I just came out to have a barbecue and sunbathe. And, they say, and, and that's not a reasonable excuse under the regulations for leaving the house. But they would have to in inquire into why they left the house rather than asking why they're there now. Um, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a mess. They can direct the person to return to the place where they're living or remove that person to the place where they're living. Um, and they may use reasonable force if necessary to remove that person. Um, children, so the, children can be um, directed um, but they have to be directed through an individual who's responsible for them, who's with them at the time. Um, and a, where, where a relevant person has reasonable grounds to believe the child is repeatedly failing to comply with the restriction in 6.1, the relevant person may direct any individual who has responsibility for the child to secure, so far as reasonably practical, practicable, that the child complies with the restriction. So that's pretty, pretty onerous on... Uh, people caring for responsible for children and parents of children because effectively they take full responsibility for the child um, who may be jumping out the window and, and going to meet, meet their friends. Um, that must be necessary and proportionate. Um, dispersal of unlawful gatherings. Where a relevant person considers three or more people are gathered together in contravention, contravention of Regulation 7, they may direct the gathering to disperse or direct any person in the gathering to return to a place where they're living or C, remove any person in, in the gathering to the place where they're living. And I should raise here the, just a question for, perhaps for later, which is that the, the language of regulation, um, of regulation 7, the ban on public gatherings, is pretty vague. Um, it says that people are not allowed to participate in a gathering, but doesn't define gathering. Um, now, David Mead, uh, Professor David Mead, has done a very good article on this. So um, I highly recommend that on, on just, just, mute, just exploring the, the issue of what it might mean with reference to public order powers um, and the and convention case law. But plainly, there is going to be quite, there are going to be questions about whether
when someone turned up at the beauty spot or the gather or, or, or the park and they found themselves as part of a gathering you know are they really participating if they're going to be dispersed or um or, or reasonable force used on them to disperse them is that power being exercised lawfully um and, and various other issues um regulation nine uh, and this is offences and penalties um so regulation nine and ten are offences and penalties a person without who without reasonable excuse contravenes any of the uh, restrictions um commits an offence a person who obstruct, obstructs a person carrying out a function under the regulations so that could be a local council um, a employee, it could be a police officer or a community support officer, um, without reasonable excuse, they commit an offence. And a person who without reasonable excuse contravenes a direction given under Regulation 8, um, or that, that's the enforcement powers. So that's somebody who, for example, is refuses to be directed out of a gathering. Um, they fa if they fail to comply with a reasonable instruction or prohibition notes that commit an offence. Um, I can see some questions popping up, so I'm, I'm going to, I, I think we'll leave them until the end of the, the summary section, because um, we're going to get to the act in a minute and then we'll, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Keep asking them, keep asking the questions. Um, regulation 9, offences are, are punishable on summary conviction by fine. Um, bodies corporate can also be fined, and uh, um, for example, a company or an officer of a company that's refusing to close or, you know, or opens when they shouldn't be open. Um, Section 24 of PACE, a uh, power of arrest without a warrant, applies, um, but the it, it's slightly difficult to understand the the language of Regulation 97, and maybe people will have a, a better idea th than I but it, it adds purposes to section 24 pace. It's not clear whether it, whether it removes the others, but it says to maintain public health and to maintain public order. Um, another question that popped up for me is, is why, why is maintain public order a reason for arrest um, under this legislation? Because this is public health legislation. There's no public order powers. It's just a question. Um, now the police may have, will have other public order powers in certain situations. For example, if there, um, there was a gathering where, and there's an attempt to disperse it and, it get, and things get, get violent, fair enough, um, but it's not clear why that comes under this, um, these regulations. Um, just finally on, on, on the regs, fixed penalty notices. So um, a fixed penalty notice can be issued to anyone that an authorised person reasonably believes has committed an offence under the regulations and is over the age of 18. And, and you may have seen in the news that something like 100, um, 100 fixed penalty notices have been given to children in error and those are being rescinded. That was reported last week. Um, I can't remember if it was one force or across the whole country, but just goes to show the confusion over these regulations. Um, and that's just one bit. A an authorised person is a constable, a police community support officer, person designated by the Secretary of State or by the, the, the relevant local authority for the purposes of this regulation. So that is pretty broad. That includes the attendance that I um, saw in the park. Um, so they could potentially issue fixed penalty notices. And when I cross-examined one of them, I probably should have asked whether they were going to be giving out fixed penalty notices, but I, I didn't um, manage it because I was too busy asking him why he was telling a woman to leave the bench she was on um, when there was nobody next to her or, or and nobody in the bench next to her either. Um, and, and a fixed penalty notice works in the same way that it does with parking offences or other fixed penalty notices, which it, it permits a person to discharge liability for conviction and for the offence by the payment of the fixed penalty, which means that if you don't pay it, you choose to take the, potentially to take it to court and, and be charged and have to defend yourself. Um, the, 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 the amount is 60 pounds if, or 30 pounds if paid within 14 days, but that doubles and doubles and doubles until it gets to 960 for subsequent offences. Um, there's some useful guidance and reports, which I've, I've included links to, um,
the Joint Commis Committee on Human Rights report, just to declare an interest, I'd, um, I'm a specialist advisor to their COVID-19 inquiry, so I, I contributed to that report, although I'm not speaking on their behalf. Um, the, the, the police guide, the police chiefs and College of Policing guidance is, is, is really good, um, with a few provisos, and the CPS guidance, um, Kirsty can speak to it. And, and I've just included in this slide a, a bit from the JCHR report, which is a useful short table, which goes to um, the differences between the government guidance and the law, which is the regulations, first of all, um, and why things have been a bit confusing, and also the, the difference between different guidance in different parts of the UK. Um, Okay, um, and I'll move um, on to Kirsty now. Thank you very much, Adam. So I'm going to pick up with the Coronavirus Act. And you can see there that that came in on the 26th of March, 2020. And it expires on the 24th of March, 2022. You, you'll immediately see that there's a a, a major difference there and obviously that this is an act of parliament so it's a primary legislation whereas the regulations we've been talking about are secondary it's secondary law secondary legislation and so the uh, and this is it's a substantive difference because when you're looking at applying the regulations you need to go back to the purpose of the public health act 1984 as very heavily amended and that has been an issue with certain academics and and others who have been debating whether or not the regulations are ultra virus and they've been looking back at the purpose of the public health act so whenever you practically are in a position where you are representing somebody who is being prosecuted or has received a fixed penalty notice under the regulations, always bear in mind that you need to go back to the purpose of the Public Health Act. It's not a public order act. So, but the Coronavirus Act has, it, it, it passed through Parliament, albeit, Adam might correct me on this, I think it was only about six days. It was extremely quick, but it, it is primary legislation. And therefore it is, it is better it's extremely draconian, but it is better than the regulations in that it does have safeguards within it. Uh, and therefore it is um, more in keeping uh, with a piece of legislation uh, that is going to have um, uh, minimal interference. Well, it's draconian, but it's, it's, it's going to be more, more likely to be compliant with convention rights than clearly the very wide-reaching regulations are. So it must be renewed every six months and the powers only apply during the transmission control period. It's activated or deactivated by the Secretary of State for Health. This is really important because initially there were announcements in fact from our Home Secretary Priti Patel that she was responsible and, and in fact I think recently she's saying she's responsible for these uh, powers but it's not that neither the regulations nor the act or anything to do with her as the Secretary of State. So if we can move on to the next slide. What's very important that all the powers that you uh, we are going to be potentially concerned with are within Schedule 21 and the aspect to note many of you are already familiar with this, but it's very clear that they, all these powers concern a person who is potentially infectious. And the definition of what somebody who is potentially infectious is, is, is set out. And there's the link to coronavirus and uh, that the person might infect or, or, be cont or contaminate uh, with coronavirus or that the person has been in an infected area within the 14 days preceding that time. So this is nothing to do with the aspect of reasonable excuse for leaving the place where you're living. This, these are powers which were brought in under this particular, particular act to assist public health officials. 
in dealing with those who might be potentially infectious. And they really break down into three uh, sections within Schedule 21. And you have the section which is uh, the pre somebody being uh, taken for assessment or screening and they uh, will we'll come on to it they basically start at about section six six and seven and then you've got the powers which are exercisable from section eight at point of assessment screening and then you've got the powers which are exercisable post assessment or screening which are section 14 onwards uh, and in the middle of that, section 13, you have some freestanding powers for police officers and immigration officers. So coming in at the police powers, we have there that if during a transmission control period, a, a constable or immigration officer has got reasonable grounds to suspect uh, that a person is potentially infectious, uh, this is the direction. They may, subject to paragraph three, direct the person to go immediately to a place specified in the direction which is suitable for screening and assessment or remove the person to a place suitable for screening and assessment. And if we can just click on. These requirements are very important. Proportionality. And the proportionality tests are set out with the uh, link back to obviously the purpose of this primary legislation in the interest of the person for the protection of other people or for the maintenance of public health. The uh, police powers um, also sets out the, the immigration, the, the additional powers, the immigration officer or the police officer uh, but they um, can, can uh, exercise powers for provision of information. And you can see within the slide, we've uh, copied and pasted that part of the provision. And within there, you can see the enforcement uh, coming uh, into being as a criminal offence. It's an offence in a case where a person is directed or fails without reasonable excuse to comply with the direction or in a case where a person is removed to abscond. So there's the criminality uh, within that act. Further powers, this is on to when you're actually in the assessment screening to, again, the, 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 to support the public health officials, to keep them there and a person who fails without reasonable excuse to comply with a direction is guilty of a criminal offence and liable on summary conviction to a fine of up to a thousand pounds. It's quite interesting here because obviously the regulations have the punishment of a fine if somebody is prosecuted and taken to court and that fine would be unlimited although it obviously would have to be means tested when actually at court and here there's a cap on, on the fine of a thousand pounds. And potential issues, well, there are many. Both sets of laws are certainly the most draconian since the Second World War. And there perhaps was some consideration that lawyers or, or activists were slightly muted when these laws came in. Perhaps because of the severity of the pandemic and clearly everybody being required to, to work together to tackle the pandemic. In my view, although there's, there's much about Lord Sumption's opinions that I don't agree with, particularly his views on the um, Article 8 and so on of the European Convention. When he on the Today programme uh, basically said these powers, and he was dealing specifically with the regulations, are 
moving us towards the police state. And he was very critical at that time that there was the use of drone surveillance by Derbyshire police. That opened up, I think, some of the more right wing press in particular to start considering what was happening here because he's not, Lord Sumption is not uh, perhaps the usual person who you would expect to have uh, made a comment like that. Now others consider that he should have remained entirely quiet as a, as a retired Supreme Court judge and, and not spoken at all. I, I disagree and I think that he is very much responsible then for the further scrutiny of, of the laws that in fact were passed and how astonishing they are. I'm going to talk very briefly about, so in order to allow time for questions, about the case of Maria and Marie Dinu. Now she's a woman I've never met, but she came to public attention because on the 28th of March of this year, staff at a railway station at, New, um, at uh, York Railway Station, um, sorry, it was Newcastle, she traveled from York, Newcastle Railway Station, contacted the British Transport Police and said that she was loitering between platforms. Now the British Transport Police, police attended upon her and she simply did not speak. The evidence uh, we discovered subsequently was that she wrote on a piece of paper the word Aberdeen and nothing else. She then was arrested and detained. So this was on the Saturday and she was detained the Saturday night, the Sunday night in, in police cells and taken to North Tyneside Magistrates Court on the Monday. She was then convicted for an offence of uh, travelling without reasonable excuse, but all under, under Schedule 21 of the Coronavirus Act. By the Tuesday, uh, a journalist at the Times newspaper contacted me to say that she'd managed to get the actual charge from the British Transport Police, and this is what it said. And she was confused. She said the Coronavirus Act it seems to deal with potentially infectious people. And I'm confirming with them that they didn't consider she was potentially infectious. Could you have a look? Uh, under the usual times deadlines, um, I had very limited time. And obviously the legislation is quite new, but it was pretty apparent that they had mashed up the regulations into the schedule or vice versa and made up uh, vice versa made up an offense and not only that it had been prosecuted and it had had it had resulted in conviction by a district judge at North Tyneside Magistrates Court and she was fined about 600 pounds plus there was a um, there was there was cost I think about 60 pounds on top of that uh, and then we discovered all of this went on in her absence because as she wasn't speaking, the district judge took the view that she was being obstructive and so sent her down from the dock to the cells. And so she was tried in her absence without even having the papers uh, served upon her, having uh, any opportunity to have the police officers come and give evidence for her to question them. All of this also was done outside the viewing of the press, who only heard about the case when there was a press announcement by the British Transport Police after the case had finished, boasting that they had been responsible for the first prosecution under the Coronavirus Act. Uh, and all of you on this webinar will be able to identify at least six fundamental uh, legal errors there. Um, uh, and we, we don't we could we could almost have a quiz on it. I mean, there's there's just so many. So uh, the Times then on the Wednesday ran the story. She was convicted of an offence that does not exist, uh, and um, I, 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 I'm relied on 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 my um, quick quick perusal. I, I would I would say that subsequently I I found myself supported by a lot of my. Uh, fellow lawyers on 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 Twitter in particular, which gave me gave me some some relief. But it, I'm sure you all know when you're dealing with new legislation and 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 
and particularly when it's gone through so many safeguards and fails so badly, there's always that, you know, how could this have happened? Am I the one who's just completely misread all of this? What's, what's gone on? Um, but uh, by literally by then the next day, the Thursday, the, uh, the, the, the case was referred back to court under Section 128, Magistrates Court, I, and, and then the conviction was set, a, uh, set aside, um, and obviously the sentence also. Uh, but also you will have spotted in there that she was clearly falsely imprisoned because there, was no, there would have been no power, there was no power to detain her um, also. So the more we heard about the case, the, 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 the more terrible... It, 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 it was, and it's very much caught a lot of attention because one thing I would say, and I, I, I'm sort of conscious of the time, so I'm going to come to a, a conclusion very shortly. But one thing I would say is that because we have 43 separate police forces in, in this country, what we've been seeing is overzealous policing and overreaching. And you have interferences potentially with articles eight, nine, 11, um, uh, 10, um, possibly five. You have, uh, there's a whole discussion going on on, on, ultra, on the varies of the regulations, whether they're ultra varies. And you have the issues that have arisen because the police have been particularly confused with what is actually guidance and the government guidance, which has, has, uh, has gone through around three different forms. You'll see on the previous slides that Adam's um, put up, that the latest guidance, which came from the Crown Prosecution Service, was actually published by the National Police Chiefs just before Easter. And that's, that's the latest attempt to clarify so basically the national police chiefs have actually adopted the cps guidance and that's their latest attempt to clarify issues such as can i drive somewhere and go to a local beauty spot and then have my exercise once i've driven and they're clarifying yes you can however they seem to have gone back on previous guidance where it, it has been set out for your own mental health. So that would be under regulation 6M, where you can get out of where you're living effectively, you can, uh, to, in order to pre prevent any, any harm, uh, which would include mental health issues. Um, within the new guidance, it's setting out that general painting and decorating um, would not be really within reasonable excuse. It has to be more uh, essential maintenance of the property. So again, there's a whole, series of questions around that. There's an absolute lack of clarity, as we can see, we set out in the potential issues. What has been interesting for me, probably approaching this as a lawyer and a practitioner, is you sometimes we quite, we think as practitioners, we quite like wide regulations and wide laws because it gives us lots of argument for people to be actually behaving lawfully because you have the space but what we've seen here is just how dangerous having wide and unclear laws is because the police are uh, absolutely uh, not covering themselves with glory and I don't think it, there can be any argument anymore that these are outliers or uh, the, the odd officer here and there and generally the forces are behaving um, entirely sensibly because what we've seen has been uh, announcements coming from police chiefs in particular where they, so the, the Adam referred to the looking into the shopping trolleys, that was the Northamptonshire police chief uh, who uh, made a pronouncement before Easter that this is potentially what the police were going to be doing and then had to backtrack. We've seen similar announcements from Derbyshire and a lot of this is up north actually, which is where I'm originally from. Lancashire has been shocking on the, I think it's issued the highest number of fixed penalty notices. And uh, there's also, do have a look, there's a video, a, a genuine video, very sadly in Accrington of a police officer who uh, the, him and his colleagues stopped to question a few young guys who were outside on the road 
and the uh, some it escalated but the officer was saying to him uh, the, the guy was saying I've done nothing wrong and the officer was saying to him you know about his attitude and said I can uh, I'll make something up who do you you think they're going to believe you or me that office has now been suspended uh, and a couple of days ago Lancashire police issued a statement obviously apologizing and uh, accepting how much damage this can do to, to public trust the final point on potential issues is there were a good half of police forces about two weeks ago who were encouraging essentially neighbours to inform on each other and with forms to, to report for any potential breach of, of the regulations. And that is not a good thing because you're breaking down trust and creating social divisions. And I've had at least, I've had one case where it's pretty clear this has come from a, a neighbour perhaps with a grudge. And uh, it, it, it really um, is, it, is, it, it then becomes an issue where general cohesion with the community can start to, to break down. So I'm going to leave it there on the, uh, so keep the act potentially, obviously potentially infectious and the uh, regulations, secondary, secondary legislation, and this is the prohibition of movement and so on. And just to finish from me, a case that I'm looking at at the moment is, uh, and we might see more of this, is what's going to happen over Ramadan, which uh, commences on Thursday for, for a month. And so there may well be uh, some movements in terms of proportionality of the closing of uh, religious uh, places, of, of, of places of worship. Um, but back to you, Adam. Okay, great. Um, just just before we open for questions, I just want to add something about virus. Um, there's, there's there's a there's a pretty hot debate going on about whether the um, lockdown regulations go beyond the powers granted by the Public Health Act. Um, for example, Tom Hickman at Blackstone, um, David Anderson at Lord Anderson. Um, uh, have put out papers uh, saying, uh, in, uh, I think uh, Tom's was with Emma Dixon, saying that they think that the old the, the regulations are ultra virus. Um, I think it's pretty it's pretty it's arguable. Put it put it that way. There's some very interesting questions about the level to which the courts would um, would be benevolent um, in these circumstances. However, it is curious that the regulations went were promulgated exactly the same time as the Coronavirus Act and could have been part of the Coronavirus Act, but weren't. Um, and there are, there's been a number of calls, um, most recently Institute for Government, um, to, to, clar to make this, um, to give the regulations the power of primary legislation or put them into primary legislation as soon as possible to get rid of any doubts. Um, because obviously if there is, um, a def you know, if, if a defendant raises this as a kind of collateral attack in a defense then it will have to be decided um it, it will it will potentially get messy uh, i'm not going to express a view about whether the argument is correct or not i think it's an open question but it is a, it is definitely a question um and and, and 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 i imagine will have to be resolved at some point so um i'm going to start looking at the questions um and please keep keep posing them um i i i've during um, Kirsty's talk, I, I was just looking up a couple, a couple of things, so I don't know the answers <laughs> off, offhand. So excuse me for sort of and my eyes going down. Um, so so a Alice Hardy has asked: Is is there no objective requirement to the enforcement powers, or are they purely subjective? I.e., the relevant person may take steps which they consider a person to be outside the contravention of Regulation Eight. That's the, well, the regulation is the powers, enforcement powers, even if an, an unreasonable belief. And the answer is that they are purely subjective. Um, they are, that's the width of the powers is in part um, because of this very, this subjective um, test for, you know, it is it, the, the fixed penalty notices. I think in, if an officer believes um, the, um, the, the, ability the power to remove somebody using reasonable force is also something like if, a, if an officer considers so they are very subjective and 
um, one of the proposals for reform of these powers has been to include an objective requirement such as, as Alice is suggesting. Um, anonymous attendee has asked how old is a child? Um, there's no definition, I don't think, in the regulations themselves. So I think the answer is under 18. Under 18, yeah. I mean, the regulations, I think that, that, that they're only actually 11 pages. I mean, it's, which is a slight astonishing thing how somebody could mix up the regulations with the Coronavirus Act because actually they're not too onerous to read. Um, Matthews asked, if a child is outside with no accompanying adult, presumably the police can exercise the enforcement power against the child directly. Um, is that correct? I think, yes, that is correct. There's no, there's no age. The only age limit in the regulations is for fixed penalty notices but it, it, it there's no um there's no limit on the age or there's no there's no lower limit um in yeah. for the age of a person for whom the police can exercise powers to for example remove them from a public gathering so a group of 15 year olds um in a park the police could in in principle use reasonable force and again it is that subjective belief um, Ruth Bowers has asked, so if you have a reasonable excuse to leave home and then whilst out decide to gather in a private place, then you are doing nothing wrong and neither is anyone else in the same position. And, and the answer is, for, well, there's two parts to that. First of all, yes, it's right. There's, there's no powers granted by these regulations for people in, pri in their private, well, in private places. I'm not going to say the def that even that definition is is going to have to be decided potentially by the courts but so for example um and it's tricky and I, and I think in scotland there's actually there is a power to go into private places i think but in england wales and northern Ireland, there isn't i may be corrected on that but i think that's right and so if someone leaves their house to um to buy essential goods and whilst out they Bump, in, bump into in the in the social distancing sense they see somebody who's a friend of theirs and says look we're having a we're having a party won't you come along and they go to the party in a private residence and the police turn up and they there's no public order issues with the party then arguably i think very arguably as long as those people have left their houses for the for for a reasonable with a reasonable excuse it's quite difficult to know what offence is being committed, even though this is something which is quite a, um, seems to be quite a common concern of police. Um, and the police don't have power of entry under these powers. So it, it's a mess. Um, in yeah, that I mean, I would say with, the, with that, Adam, as well, with the, I, I noticed I saw somebody quoted actually in one of the, one, one of the media outlets, I think last week, because this has happened in Manchester, where the, police went in to break up a party or several parties and and I noticed there was somebody quoted saying that they had power of entry and I don't think that's right mm -hmm. under pace that they they wouldn't have power of entry and and so you know again I don't know what's happening in that case but um they were all they were all arrested but so yeah I I I, I agree with you um there on that as to um it's it's kind of a tricky one but they they all entered on the basis the police entered on the basis that they had a power to break up a gathering in a private place it seems which obviously they don't um rupert bowers has also asked um regarding fixed penalty notices there isn't any power to ask your name and address is there no there isn't um, and that's in the um, it's made clear in the guidance, in the yeah. College of Policing guidance, which says there's no power of stop and account. Yeah, it um, is. Although I would say with that, Adam, it, it does make it clear that there's no power of stop or account, a stop and account. But if you're looking at what's the reasonable excuse for being outside your place of living, if the person doesn't say anything, is that then going to give them reasonable grounds to consider that they have no reasonable excuse? And if somebody remains entirely silent, then no doubt that would be their grounds initially looking at the lawfulness of their actions at that point. Yeah. Um, however, yeah. however, you can't lose sight of that these regulations are meant to be for the protection to prevent the spreading of the virus and protection of people from the virus, their public health. So somebody standing on their own 
um, uh, with with no no contact with anybody. Um, there's much more sort of guidance now and the police really should be applying their common sense to the, to that sort of person rather than actually placing them in danger by getting in contact with them and and, uh, and even getting them within a, a, an unsanitary setting such as the police station so they're actually quite, I think one one astonishing thing for me with this is quite often the police actions are actually adding to the danger and going contrary to the whole purpose of the laws in the first place and adding to the danger to the police as well yeah, um, who, who who have not always have not always had public uh, ppe um personal protective yeah. equipment and, and just just to, i mean R rupert's question goes on and, and to exactly the point you just made kirsty how can they give you an fpm and also how do they physically give it to you without breaching the two meter yeah. guidance presumably you could stand behind the, uh, that to refuse to take it um, I agree with you, Kirsty, that, that, that because there's a, an offence of obstructing somebody carrying out a function under the Act, it it's becomes a bit more difficult um, if you're just refusing to answer or refusing to account for yourself. But if there's no power, there's no power. Um, but I would, I, I'd add a, a general point to the one that you made, which I think is exactly right, about the, this, these are public health powers mm -hmm. and the police should be approaching them entirely through that lens. I mean, it's something I've said and I've written as well, that I think the way that the police should be thinking about these powers and, and particularly around prioritization, you know, what are they prioritizing and why? They should be speaking to, they should be look, listening to public health officials and taking public health advice on what are the real risks? You know, is it going to be people going out of the house to buy Easter eggs on their own? And socially distancing is it going to be people sunbathing in the park alone you know without anybody else around them because there is no so there's a there's a generalized risk of when more people leave the house and are out and about and are, in, are, are going out and about as if there was nothing happening clearly there's a generalized risk but in those situations it is difficult to understand what what the risk is with somebody who is keeping a so socially distancing and they're outside. Now that compares to, for example, um, pu public gatherings, like, you know, people having outside barbecues when they're all near each other. I think that is very, quite yeah. clearly a public health risk. Yeah. As is, um, you, you know, as is, actually, as is parties in houses. I mean, and unfortunately, that, or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it, those aren't part of the regulations, but those are, clearly people yeah. gathering in, in inside is a public health risk so i think that it's it's a bit of a minefield um and the guidance and i agree with you that the the exception that the and not the behavior we're seeing which we're concerned about is probably not anomalous if if it's emerging from so many different places um hey chapman's asked Reinforcement for children, um, regarding enforcement for children failing to comply with Regulation 6, that's the reasonable excuse, leaving the house regulation, what sort of measures are the police taking or you envisage the police may take against parents as they can't make them lock their children up? As, well, I suppose they can't, especially when the children are teenagers. Are there any measures that you'd expect would be reasonable? Thanks. Um, Kirsty, what, what, do you, what do you think th this could mean? They, what, what can they be asking people to do to deal with children? Yeah, I mean, they, 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 the, the National Police Chief's guidance, not the one on the just before Easter, but the one before that, which um, I think was the 31st of March. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that because there's been so many now. And that sets out that the police should be engaging explaining so explaining what the potential legal breaches are encouraging so encouraging that that you know that there's a sort of step away from a potential breach and it's only as a last resort that there's enforcement and that applies across the board with with every situation inclu including with 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 a parent and i, I would make a comparison in some ways to uh, when, when myself and Adam have spoken about this previously. I, I was looking back on the um, enforcement of ASBOs you know, when they came in in, in, in 19, 
1998 and that was under the Labour government and that's really the first time we have police actually policing public spaces in, in, in that way and, and they overall were a total disaster because they ended up criminalising children and in, in situations where they there was no imprisonment for example on the the original act that they were actually doing and, the, and there's a real danger here but with with parents um you have to look at the circumstances and it all has to be entirely proportionate and um you, you'd have to really be having the the, the parent within some sub, sub, substantive breach where they're 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 ignoring um, deliberately flouting directions from the police and so on but keep, keeping that public health uh lens um firmly in place and always relying on that this any enforcement is meant to be absolute last resort I, i finally say just on this with it's unfortunate i think that the fixed penalty notice which in itself is draconian has a may there that the police may give a fixed penalty notice so there's nothing within the regulations which is essentially stopping the police from jumping straight to criminal prosecution which is one of the issues we've been seeing and also many of the forces didn't actually have the forms for uh, fixed penalty notices many still don't and what should have happened is that it should have been that enforcement is an absolute last resort should have been made very clear and then the second stage should have been looking at fixed penalty notice and then the third stage is looking at prosecution but at the moment you've got a jump with a big gap from six uh, to enforcement at nine on, on criminal prosecution and that can devastate people's lives with having having a conviction recorded against them um sam your gannon has asked does the charge potentially constitute a malicious prosecution in particular if you buy groceries and have something which is non-essential like chocolate eggs and you get charged for it but it's definitely a wrongful prosecution yeah, it's, malicious, um, it's always hard isn't it but um... I, I i i think in the early days the police will be ex will be excused for not understanding the law in terms of any kind of malicious prosecution but they'll obviously be wrong that those those offences will will be appealable. But I think, you know, as things go on, if there's a sort of, you know, um, if there's a, a kind of hostile relationship between the police and local communities who are, and I, and I think we saw this um, in Northamptonshire with uh, Nick Adderley um, coming out and saying, look, you know, if people are going to keep taking the mickey out of our police officer or something to that effect, then we're going to set up roadblocks and um, start shopping trolleys. And he was very he very quickly reneged on that but the because it's against all the guidance um but that kind of antagonistic um relationship between the police and, and local communities if that leads to deliberate wrongful charging um and and certainly the if the video that came out of Lan uh, at lancashire had um led to a charge which it didn't as I, as I understand it where the police officer said i'll make something up that's obviously yeah. malicious but i think just making a mistake won't um, but the mistakes as the police get more familiar with these rules the police you know that they, they will be less there'll be more of an inference that they may be um you know and, and be, be antagonistic so that they need to be careful um anonymous attendee is asked to be clear can a local authority designate a relevant person for enforcement under regulation 10 i.e fixed penalty notices relating to restrictions on movement notwithstanding the limited power of the designation itself to reg four and five earlier in the regs i, I don't know the answer um off without having it in front of me um so i will if anonymous attendee if you email me the, the email address is at the bottom of each slide uh, which i've just put on so um email me and i'll answer it um um Kirsten, do you want to take this one from nick stanage um, in what we might call a run-of-the-mill county court claim against the police, for example, where one, the police have unlawfully directed a potential claimant to return to where they're living, two, there are no aggrav aggravating features, I believe, alas, that only very modest or indeed nominal damages would be recoverable, and a ward of exemplary damages seem unlikely since the intention of the police is to save life. Therefore, stories that make good headlines might make poor claims. Um, do any of our solicitor colleagues think otherwise? Um, or, or you, Kirsty? Yeah, well, that might be one for, for solicitors' colleagues. I'm quite happy to, to duck that one. But I mean, it all depends on the, on the circumstances. But, but yes, I mean, a, a situation like that 
as as Nick Stanish has set out. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that. But I think the, the cases that have made headlines aren't those type of cases because the the one that really hit the headlines was a, a woman who didn't speak standing at a platform who ends up unlawfully you know falsely imprisoned for two nights in in cells and then uh, and then you know convicted for an offence that didn't 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 actually exist. So I, I don't think those types of cases are making the headlines actually sadly um the, the behavior is much more extreme yeah um anonymous attendee um to adam court journos are key workers court journo may be a key worker in their own right because all public service to, in yeah. making proceedings judgments then I, i'm sure that's right i mean it must be yeah right. they are key work they are key workers i think this is uh, sorry it was for you adam but um i, I actually been doing quite a, quite interested in this at the moment there's going to be it's, it's not my usual uh, newspaper to of choice particularly but the Daily Mail there's a journalist a, a very good journalist there she's a senior crime correspondent called Rebecca Camber and she has been researching on the uh, lack of openness of of courts and the figures so her article's coming out fairly soon the figures are pretty astonishing and there's a real issue I've been looking into it a bit recently some of the crown courts are saying that they are uh, uh, open in public in that one crown court i think it's canterbury is is being beamed into maidstone and maidstone's actually open but of course under the regulations it'd be very difficult to argue that if you just wanted to see what's going on in court that day it's going to be rather difficult to argue that you've got a reasonable excuse so um but otherwise on the remote hearings uh, it, it, what's really happening is we are having um secret hearings by default and the journalists are not able to get listings of the cases in advance and they are having difficulties actually attending the hearings and i think that's a real issue for open justice and um, yeah. public hearings and, and 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 as a plug you can listen to the last but one better human podcast episode um which was with natalie byram and Pen penelope gibbs on on that issue on open justice um, and court reporting in the time of coronavirus and online hearings. Um, what would you advise clients disputing a fixed penalty notice? Did you want to? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it depends on. I I, I think it, if the I mean, it depends on on again on the situation of the of, of the dispute. But maybe that's one to because we we're sort of I think we're. We're, we're coming up um, we, we, everyone's been on, on on chatting for a while so if there's anything specific we could we could uh, quite happy to have a look but but not what's not clear I don't think Adam is that obviously with it's, it's very clear with a criminal prosecution you're going to get a criminal record but it's not clear with the fixed penalty notices whether or not that would come up on an enhanced check and so we don't know necessarily what impact that could have on, on on people's lives in the future and we can see the sort of devastating effect that convictions themselves can, can have you know if you, you're applying for a job or you're applying for a visa or a mortgage and so on and so um if there is a dispute on a fixed penalty notice um the pe people would, would would be would be much safer um trying to en engage with it to get to get rid of it yeah um the Rupert Bowers asked, why shouldn't neighbours or others inform if they're aware someone is committing an offence? If your neighbour was a burglar, you would tell the police, what's the difference? Um, I th I, just very quickly on this, I think that my concern with the police form, so a lot of police started putting up forms a couple of weeks ago, online forms, um, saying if you've seen a breach of the regulations, then report it through the form. And, and there, one of the reasons they said for that was that they were worried that the, the phone lines were blocked with people calling up and saying, I think my neighbor's just gone out for a second run um, and they need to be you know, used for other things. The problem with the forms is they were, they were pretty mixed bag in terms of whether they said what people should report for so some were saying if you think people have breached the guidance and the guidance isn't and to answer a question which comes a bit later the guidance isn't in any way has no legal force at all unless it's reflected in the regulations so for example in in, in england there's no there's no legal restriction on the amount of times you go out to exercise you go out as long as it's you as long as you need and and it's reasonable um and so there is a sort of restriction 
then you can go out as many times as, as you want. But that's one point. And, and the other point is just in terms of social cohesion, I know Kirsty mentioned this. I do think there's thinking about this from a public health perspective, you know, we're all we've all got to um, look after each other during this very, very difficult time for the country. And, and I think that there's a very delicate balance between um, yes, giving police a bit of understanding of what's going on in, in certain areas, if there's widespread obvious breaches secondly using that opportunity to educate the public on what the law actually is which the form should do and third of all not encouraging people to inform on their neighbors you know like we're living in um you know uh, communist um czechoslovakia or, or, or wherever so i just think that there is a, a, a delicate balance um, i'm gonna i'm gonna rush through and, and, and kirsty sort of just jump in um if you want to Matt Foote, the photo of the demo we've seen in Israel, uh, where large numbers were socially distancing from each other, would that be legal here? The answer, I think, is no. Um, I think that regardless, there's no social distancing requirements in the regulations, but I can't see how a, de a, a demonstration, an organised demonstra demonstration, unless it was lots of people from the same household, would not be a gathering of over two people uh, within the, the meaning of Regulation 7. So. I, think I appreciate what you, what you'd, yeah i mean i think what you'd have to I, I agree with you adam i think what you'd have to do with a situation like that is 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 contact the police chief of the area and and indicate that there are going to be a number of people outside they're keeping social distancing etc these these safeguards are being put in place in order to comply with the purpose of the primary legislation the public health act and um, indicate that the expectation is that the police will not enforce their powers under the regulations because it would not be proportionate to do so. So you'd be doing something like that. Yeah, and tricky. And JRing. <laughs> but, but tricky. Um, yeah, of obviously, obviously, as, as the lockdown continues and there may be proportionality questions um, over Article 11 and Article 10 rights, but at the moment, it's the, the, the public gatherings is pretty clear. Um, you'd have to, as Kirsty said, you'd have to be pretty, pretty quite brave and, and have an arrangement. Um, can people, can the officers ask pretty much anything under Regulation 8 and, and refuse to provide comply, therefore be an offence under Regulation 9, provided they have some relief, you're breaching Regulation 6? I mean, yeah, I think we kind of discussed that a bit earlier. Um, it's this question of whether there is a stop and account power. Y you do get into slightly mur murky territory if you're just refusing to answer questions and it's not not recommended. But technically, um, the I mean, perhaps the answer is the police should tell you that you don't have. There's no um, power to for you to force you to answer, or there's no yeah. offence of forcing to of refusing to answer. Yeah, I mean, you still, you've got the, I mean, the pace powers will will always be what the police will fall back on. And, and the pace power section 24, obviously, is it's actually specifically mentioned within the coronavirus regulations as being applicable. So that's what you would look at in the situation of somebody not cooperating. Yeah. But uh, technically, Pete, oh, sorry. You don't have, yeah, technically, you don't have to say anything. Peter, Water, Peter Walker has asked a, a question about the Coronavirus Act. Arguably, a potentially infectious person encompasses everyone. In what circumstances would you not be potentially infectious? Very important and interesting question. There's some good, um, there's some good discussions on, I think, the EGIL Talk um, blog about whether Article 5 is engaged at all. And if it's engaged, whether by, by the... Um, by the uh, Coronavirus Act and by the, the regulations. But if it is engaged, this idea of a potentially infectious person, if it is being applied as it is to everyone in the United Kingdom at the moment because of the, the, um, the highly infectious nature of COVID-19, does that fall within the exception in Article 5 to, um, to prevent the spread of, inf of an infectious disease, which I think is the language of Article 5? And in fact, my understanding is the derogations that have been lodged by a number of Eastern European states yeah. um, to the convention um, are on the basis, in part, of an assumption that Article 5 doesn't extend further than somebody who can be proven to be potentially infectious, 
in, in advance rather, or is obviously or is clearly infectious because of a, of a test wouldn't apply to somebody who's for example been you know if I've been socially isolating in my house on my own for two weeks then I you know very arguably I, I am not potentially infectious in any in any interpretation so why am I caught by the coronavirus act so it, it's very comp complicated mm. and difficult um, yeah. and well you know it's going to be litigated if not here then somewhere in the Council of Europe um, and, and and I think I mean my, my my initial view on this is that at the moment because of the nature of COVID-19 there is a good argument that article 5 allows for the because it doesn't say potentially infectious people it says preventing the spread of infection arguably it does allow for people to be in uh, restricted their liberty have their liberty restricted um to prevent the spread but as time goes on and you know for example if people develop immunity and that is an open question as well or if um lots of people have been socially isolating for a long time are they still potentially infectious you know it, it is it is a minefield i think we're I, I don't know, I'll just ask you, Adam, just to have a quick skim through, but we're, we're obviously available for, for, for contact. The, the only thing I would just throw in there is uh, with the regulations, of course, they could have been brought under the Civil Contingencies Act, which is important because that would have given Parliament a supervisory role over the regulations. So as Adam mentioned earlier, not only were they not brought within the Coronavirus Act with various safeguards within that, the regulations were, were not brought under the Civil Contingencies Act, which would have um, provided more supervision and, and safeguards. And we can only presume that that was, that was done very deliberately. And my view is it's, it's, it's actually backfiring uh, because potentially you're going to, if things continue as they are, you're going to end up with people withdrawing cooperation from the police and, and, uh, that, and, and, and the trust of the, of the police might not have been so high initially but it, it it seems to be to be plummeting i mean i'm i'm certainly getting communications every day from 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 members of the public um about issues in their in their area i i, I agree and, and 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 it's and it's notable that the th through a quirk of the timing of this crisis the these regulate the reg the lockdown regulations which ordinarily under the Public Health Act would have to be voted on by Parliament within 28 days, have had they they are in force for almost double that because of the Easter recess because those 28 days don't include periods of recess, so the government has had a very very long period of totally un unexamined and unscrutinised powers, which is not from a public policy perspective it's just not it's not good. Because the powers will not, you know, there's all sorts of uh, probably um, unclear and 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 uh, I, I would go as far as saying mistakes in the wording of the power of, of the regulations, and I think that could have been avoided. But anyway, I mean, we'll, we'll see where we get to with scrutiny. Um, we're going to wind up now. Um, there is Neil Brown. I couldn't find the form to fill in um, for fixed penalty notices. I did look. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I've seen it. I've seen a screenshot of it somewhere, but I couldn't find it looking. Um, and is there a record of who FPNs are being given to? There's definitely been numbers released, which are very widely, dis yeah. um, widely vary across forces. But I haven't seen a breakdown of individuals apart from the fact that all the ones given to children are going to have to be rescinded um, and presumably, uh, you know, uh, apologies made. Um, and, and I think I think that's it. That that's um, we, we've kept you for an hour and a half. The people who made it from the very beginning. So, thank you so much for for joining us. I'm um, sorry about the confusion with the link. Um, the our email address is at the bottom of the um, of the of the handout, and we will email around the slides um, as soon as we can. So you'll have that. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, Kirsty, anything you want to say? No, other than other than thank you very much. It's it's always really interesting to have these discussions, and I don't think Adam or myself are saying we we have absolutely all the answers. And but I think what we are seeing is is testing is going to be start starting to happen in 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 the courts um, as the longer that these um, these regulations go on, because they were simply.
reviewed on the 16th of April and just simply came back in again. And, we, and we've not even seen any debate or report around why they've been reviewed in this form where they're not working. So um, I, I, I think there's, uh, the, the, there's, there's quite an area for uh, us to really be considering whether the government's taking seriously um, proportionality in, in civil liberties along with the purpose of the Public Health Act to actually stop the pandemic, which of course is what we all want. But yeah, thank you very much, everybody. And, and just two plugs before we go, plug for, for my podcast, the Better Human podcast, which um, Kirsty was in an episode, I think three episodes ago, it's, it's rapidly, um, we're rapidly churning out episodes for, to deal with coronavirus. And the second plug is the Joint Committee on Human Rights um, inquiry into COVID-19 has, has got an open call for um, submissions. So that, that's open for another couple of months, but you can find it on the Joint Committee on, of Human Rights website. So thanks very much to everybody. We'll email out the link to the recording and also to the handout. And I'm going to end the seminar if I can find the... <laughs>